so, I mean, it's uh, we've been working on this project for, for more than a year, or at least Katarina has. Two of our fellows have been working on this for more than a year. Uh, I signed on in, in January. And it's tough to like think about where to start because things have changed so much over the course of, you know, certainly my uh, certainly my involvement in the project. So I guess I'd maybe start with you, Katarina, and just sort of ask like, how, how did the pandemic sort of change how you were looking at this project or what you set out to do in the first place? Uh, it changed everything. Um, so I started off in late August, September last year. And by the time that Steve joined us, we, like another colleague of mine who's not here, Lizzie Mulvey, we had been working on a few story ideas together. We've been following up some approaches, which were kind of different from what we're doing right now, because then kind of like COVID hit and just changed everything. And we I feel like the three of us quickly realized that we needed to come up with new ideas and discard the old ones because everything was just changing. And since we've been covering voting access, COVID also impacted the way of how people are voting across the country this year. I mean, we're seeing this with the rise in absentee ballot requests, for instance. And it also changed the way of how election officials across the country are working and trying to kind of like step up and make sure that everyone gets the access they need to actually cast their vote. Um, so I'd say like in March, early April, we just started coming up with new ideas. And basically, I wouldn't say it totally went back to zero because we had done enough research to at least had the knowledge to kind of like build up on that. But we knew that everything we would be covering this year had to include COVID. Um, and that's what we did. And I feel like our stories show how COVID impacted the way of voting across the country, the challenges election officials are facing across the country, and how voters have to kind of like, I don't know, make sure that they can actually cut their votes during this pandemic. Yeah, I, and so, uh... Jackie and Asim, who came into this project a few months later, they, they didn't come into this project until July. Uh, I'm curious, you know, what was that experience like for you? Uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, uh, and we'll uh, follow up with Sarah, who came in even later than that. Um, but, uh, you know, what has this re reporting experience been like for you? Start with Jackie. Okay, that's good. I already unmuted. So, um, so I mean, I've, I've been reporting on voting issues before I started um, with CJI, but in the context of CJI, literally all I know is elections through the, the lens of COVID. Um, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the, the work that we've had to do was really um, digging into records and making phone calls. Obviously, if we were able to go in person and meet people, you know, speak with clerks or speak with people who fear that their ballots have been rejected, um, it would have been able to add a dimension that we couldn't get by reporting remotely. But I still think, I mean, we're still doing the job. A lot of it is just having conversations and looking at numbers. Seem you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd echo with what Jackie said. I think that it, it has been, you know, as a first real journalism gig. It's been kind of an unusual experience uh, to do national and even local reporting, uh, you know, from your, from your tiny box. Um, and, um, but at the same time, you know, having local partners, having, um, you know, working with really experienced people uh, who know what they're doing has been, uh, has provided a lot of structure, I think, to the process, uh, to, in, you know, uh, in doing what I think is a very big, big undertaking. We're just trying to tackle really big questions about how something as big as, you know, an election is working. Um, you know, that, that, that support that, um, you know, the experience that we get, uh, that we are sort of party to from, uh, from all these sort of longer standing uh, re local and national partners is, has sort of provided at least me a template for how to think about reporting these kinds of things in the future. And so it matters less that we are trapped and cooped up in places that, you know, where we can't access um, you know, the can't do the interviews in person or can't talk to people and, and travel and meet them where they are. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Sarah, Sarah Gelbard, who joined us as a researcher, uh, you know, a month and a half ago, I'm, I'm curious, what, would you think jumping into a project that was sort of really on its way already, um, did, uh, you know, what, did you find any, you know, sort of challenges to coming into this project remotely and, and sort of uh, hitting the ground running? You're muted. Sorry about that. Um, I came into this without um, much of a background in um, political reporting or elections reporting, um, but it was, you know, as Jackie and Asim have said, it was really wonderful to be working with experienced journalists and um, the, the fellows at CJI, um, I, I think I um, was provided with a, with a good footing and spent a lot of time um, in Excel spreadsheets um, looking for and, and filling in um, data and um, was able to feel useful. I think um, as far as remote reporting goes, um, it, it is certainly harder to reach and build rapport with sources over the phone. Um, so that was um, an added challenge that I think everyone is facing now. Um, but I, I feel like I've, I've certainly learned a lot over the past couple of months. Um, and I'm really grateful to be reporting on elections right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, we ended up through the course of this project publishing close to, probably close to 10 stories, but, uh, you know, we had three really main uh, publications that came out in the last couple of weeks, one of which came out today, uh, and one of which will premiere tonight on PBS. Um, uh, but the the first thing that we, we did was an analysis of absentee ballot rejections, obviously, uh, voting by mail became a uh, a big issue in the country with the pandemic. Um, it became highly politicized, uh, and there was a lot of rhetoric surrounding it. Um, uh, maybe, yeah, Katarina, do you want to talk a little bit about you know how the team approached uh, sort of figuring out uh, you know what what the potential was for 2020 in terms of absentee balance? Mm -hmm. um, so we and. I mean, I assume you're referring to the one we just published, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so we were trying to see, given the pandemic and everything that's going on, and also what you've already pointed out, Steve, the rise in voting by mail, how all of that would affect voters when they're trying to cast an absentee ballot this year. So we relied on data from the EVE survey, which is a survey that's done every two years by the federal agency for elections in this country. And the data is a bit messy and I, I mean, we can talk about it, we don't have to talk about the data, but let's just say for now, it's a bit messy to work with, but it was still the most complete picture we have when we're talking about voting in a general election. So we stick to the last general election in 2016 and took the data to kind of like estimate how voters would be affected mm -hmm. if they vote by mail this year. I mean, of course there were like some caveats because we were assuming that turnout would be the same, that the submission of absentee ballots and the rejections would be the same, but we kind of stick to the, that, we stuck to that criteria. Um, and we found out that more than 1 million voters would be likely to have their ballots rejected in the upcoming election if the same rejection rate applies, like the rate from 2016. We got some help from a PhD researcher at Columbia University, which was also great being part of like Columbia journalism investigations, because then you're able to reach out to experts from different fields at the university who can just kind of like fact check what you've been doing. Because I feel like all of us were, we were pretty sure that we wanted to get this right especially that one data analysis, because we know that so much is at stake. Uh, and it's just been unprecedented. And I feel like this election year is also already like super polarizing. So I feel having actually a PhD researcher 
and then Mark Hansen at Chico again to kind of like go through this analysis personally helped me a lot. Um, so we've been then like using this data and we still reached out to election clerks and I feel like that's, that's what every, everyone has already pointed out that that was basically a reporting like calling people, uh, checking in, making sure, just asking how are you doing um, and what are the basis you're, you're, I mean what are the challenges you're facing and do you feel you're getting enough support either from like your local government, from the federal government um, so yeah, so we kind of then ended up publishing this analysis I think like two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, you know, I'm curious, and maybe I'll, I toss this to to a seam since you, you and Jackie did a lot of uh, local calls early on in in your fellowships. I mean, to, how important do you feel like talking to local officials, local election officials on the ground? was um and you know and we did this through partnerships with usa today uh, uh primarily uh how, how important was it talking to local partners and and people on the ground to sort of get a sense of what was happening is that for me either one <laughs> all right um i i think it was absolutely key i think that that you, without that you wouldn't have a story and you wouldn't have a, an accurate story and i think that you know, that experience and, and, and those conversations, I think, were, to me, really drove home the point that, that these officials are uh, generally very competent. They really want what's best for their communities. They really want what's best for the process. Um, it is a very, very, it paints a very, very stark contrast to, I think, the very partisan rhetoric that exists uh, on, you know, people who want to, among, you know, people who want to make political change. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it really, I, I think it, it's, it's something that's difficult to realize today how nonpartisan and how, and, and the good faith in which a lot of these, um, these officials operate uh, without, you know, without the support that they probably deserve. Um, you know, unfortunately, their work has become politicized in a way that, it, that has not been before. Uh, but the fact that they don't get adequate funding or they don't get adequate resources is not new. Um, and, you know, if there's anything perhaps of silver lining that will come out of this, it's the, it's the importance that, you know, funding election administration, um, it, you know, deserves, uh, might be brought to light a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess I'll kick back to Katarina for a second and just, you know, a big part of this for us was working with uh, local publishing partners like uh, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, Detroit Free Press. Uh, you know, we had we partnered with papers in Pennsylvania, down in Texas. You know, we were talking to a lot of folks. We spent a lot of time in Wisconsin uh, in April. Um, you know, and worked a lot with the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel as we were trying to make sense of this all. I think, um, Katarina, I'm curious. Did you think that that experience was sort of formative for you in terms of helping understand where you know we should go with this project? Yeah, definitely. I feel like, so when we were covering this election in Wisconsin in early April, it was just, I think it kind of like, it summed up what, or it kind of like gave me a forecast into what we would be dealing with in the months to come. Because it was the, they, the, the Wisconsin decided to go through with the election during the pandemic. And cases, like the number of cases were still rising. And nonetheless, they decided to do it. So it was great to have the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel as a partner. Uh, I know Lizzie and I totally enjoyed working with them for all the stories we did together because they were just like so good in what they're doing. And as the others have pointed out, it's key to have like partners on the ground who just know their communities. Um, but yeah, definitely. I feel like that, that election in April was so weird in a way but also it's like so telling of what we've been dealing with. Yeah, um, that it kind of, yeah, it, it was a good example of what, we've, what we would be covering in, well, basically up until now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one, one of the other things that, you know, we placed a lot of focus on and has obviously been a highly politicized issue is voter fraud. Um, uh, and we looked into uh, the Heritage Foundation, which is a conservative think tank that has become a, a sort of uh, icon uh, as far as the issues of voter fraud are concerned. They have a database of uh, what they say are, as of today, I believe, 1,298 proven cases of voter fraud. 
And, uh, and we, we dug into that database to see, because there's a lot of rhetoric surrounding voter fraud and by all accounts, evidence suggests it's not nearly as widespread as it is perhaps made out to be. Uh, so we dug into the cases that did exist uh, on this. Um, you know, Jackie, you probably know more about voter fraud than anybody here at this point. Uh, <laughs> what what did you find? What did we find when we uh, sort of dug into that database? Well, Sarah and I spent a lot of time uh, looking at all of this. Um, I think that my main takeaway from all of this is that as a conservative talking point, the Heritage Foundation's voter fraud database uh, just isn't good evidence for that. So we essentially disproved it as like, if that's the one claim that you have that voter fraud is so prevalent, it's not even a good, a good claim. Um, as we were looking through this, um, we found that there were a lot of um, errors just about like the categorization of whether an absentee ballot was used or if it had to do with um, registration, uh, whether it was um, elected officials or people running for office um, that were actually uh, doing things that were problematic, which is not always the same as voter fraud. It's like a different form of, it's a different kind of crime. Um, so what we found is basically that all of these things get conflated with each other. Um, there's already been a lot of articles that suggest that even if you took the Heritage Foundation's database as like, uh, as like all the evidence of voter fraud, like it's still extremely rare. And then add to that, that a lot of these cases just aren't what they seem to be. Um, I mean, we found things like, um, I was reading through court records and able to find some transcripts and interviews with uh, uh, a mother who would cast a ballot for her son who was a college student that he had heard on campus rumors that they weren't gonna be able to vote on campus. So he asked his mom to send his ballot for him, um, but then he voted in person and he forgot to tell his mom that he voted in person. So this person's on the list and like it was, truly an accident that could have happened to, that could have happened to me. Um, so I don't know, this was such a fun story to work on because these stories were, some of them were extremely wacky. There was one case where someone was listed as fraudulent use of absentee ballots and it was a murder for hire case. So that, that's not exactly the same thing. And like, why is that, that, that's not the big problem there. The problem is probably the murder for hire. <laughs> uh, Sarah, Sarah, I'm curious because you spend a lot of time in that data as well. Um, you know, how was it, was it difficult to track that? I mean, you, you guys were looking at cases that in some, you know, were decades old sometimes. I mean, was it difficult to track down information or were you surprised by, you know, sort of what you found as you did? I think you're muted again. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, um, some, sometimes I was, I was frustrated um, by um, how difficult it seemed to to track certain things down, and you know, at other times I was really um, uh, surprised by what I found. I I found um, one case in um, the, the Heritage database records that was from 1948. Um, and um, you know, just as as Jackie said, all all sorts of different things that are um, that are conflated and not systematically organized, and um, you know, people who um, sort of made innocent mistakes labeled as fraudsters. Um, someone um, helping elderly voters fill out absentee ballots and, and forgetting to sign her name um, and things like change of address um, and the fact that all of this um, was lumped together and is used and cited um, all over the place to make um, inferences about the likelihood of um, voting issues today was you know um, really worrisome and I'm, I'm really glad that we got to dig into that and I'm, I'm 
Um, I, I feel lucky to have been a small part of it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, another thing that we were part of uh, supporting and, you know, we had was, uh, was with PBS Frontline, who produced a documentary called Who's Vote Counts, which uh, premieres actually today on the 20th. Um, you know, I'm curious for anybody, do you think that it's, you know, helpful to have, you know, it features, uh, you know, uh, Columbia, our Columbia colleague Jelani Cobb, uh, also the New Yorker, um, who is a historian. Do you think that perspective is important for uh, stories like this to have somebody, you know, that can sort of speak to the history of, uh, of any given issue? And anybody can answer that, I guess. Um, I, I mean, absolutely. Like we know, even just in the context of COVID, how frequently rules surrounding elections and how ballots can be cast or changed. So of course, having you know historical context is going to be important. Um, plus, having the I think the visuals, especially because um, for us, we weren't able to go physically, you know, speak to people. But having the visual in a film uh, where you can see things like the long lines or the clerks putting things in the machines. Um, that really shows people how complicated the whole process is. I mean, I, until I was making these calls with all these clerks in Michigan uh, a few months ago, I had no idea just how much variety there is from one county to another or one township in Michigan to another. Um, like there's just so many, there's so many steps, there's so many places for something to go wrong. And it's amazing to see when things go right. I think another, another reason why Historical context, I think, matters so much for a story like this is because, you know, out of context, a lot of voting rules that exist, you know, don't make a lot of, they don't make a lot of sense. And it's also not easy to see why they may be good or bad for a particular situation. You know, uh, for example, um, you know, uh, when you have, uh, uh, you know, voter ID laws that say, hey, you need to have, uh, you need to present valid ID to vote, um, you know, to, to the untrained observer, somebody who doesn't know the history of this sort of thing, it doesn't necessarily strike you as a particularly onerous or bad, um, you know, requirement to say, hey, you need to prove that you are this person uh, to come, you know, to come vote. You know, when, before I knew much about voting, that didn't seem to be a particularly big ask you know, to me as a voter is to be able to show an ID. But then you realize that this sort of thing has a history of, um, you know, of being implemented in such a way that the people who have the least access to, um, you know, to, to, to these kinds of documents are the ones that, you know, are, are not, the one, not the ones who tend to vote in a way that favors the, the party that passes these requirements. Uh, and so I think that having the context for who is likely to vote in a particular way or, who is, um, you know, who is passing a certain type of law is very important to understanding the context in which these laws operate. Uh, and the rules that exist don't exist in a vacuum. They exist for a particular reason. And the history, you know, going back all the way to Jim Crow uh, is, is important to understanding how these things work. Um, you know, you know, sort of going off of that, you know, I, this is, you know, something that we we focused on a lot is just sort of staying grounded in the data that we had, staying grounded in the research that we had. I, I'm curious for any of you, like, how important was that to you through this process? I mean, we're all in our own little pods and stuff like that, and there is just so much rhetoric around every aspect of everything that we're doing, um, you know, and I certainly can be confusing for the public, um, but, you know, I, I'm curious, is it ever a challenge to sort of you know, separate fact from fiction and, uh, you know, uh, as you're, you're sort of working on this and, and how important is it to, to sort of remain grounded in your work, did you feel? Again, that can be open to anyone. But I'll pick Katarina because nobody has. Okay. Um, sorry, what was the question? How I can differentiate between fact and fiction? When it uh, just, just that how, how important was it to stay grounded in your work and was it ever challenging with all of the rhetoric surrounding, you know, the different aspects of things that we were working on, uh, you know, as a reporter was that, uh, is it tricky in this to, to do, to navigate, I guess. Yeah, I think it was, I don't know, at least to me, I think it was fairly doable 
I feel like talking to election officials across the country just helps a lot mm -hmm. to kind of like recheck your perspectives and your approach and kind of like see how people on the ground are actually doing this and like what kind of steps they take during that whole voting process. So that helped a lot. Um, I feel also like talking to experts, just in general, even if you don't use it for a story, but just kind of like to deepen your, your knowledge, just trying to, I feel like all of us are trying to make this right and make it as accurate as possible. So just drawing from that knowledge of people who had already been covering this for years, or even like researching helped me a lot to make sure that I can actually differentiate between some partisan rhetoric and the facts. Um, so I think it's okay. I mean, of course, obviously, like just covering this beat this year is like especially polarizing. Like whatever you do, there will always be someone who's not okay with that. And it, this is like, this goes across all parties. But I think that's also just part of our job. Like we're just trying to kind of like educate the public and make sure that they have all the information they need to make an informed decision, especially when it comes to voting. So I feel that's nothing. I mean, I wasn't particularly worried about that. Like, I don't know, having someone from either party uh, or ideology being like, I think this is voter suppression. And then I'm just like, whoa, but here are the facts. Um, so yeah, I think it was okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, I think what Katarina said also about like just this kind of quest for knowledge is extremely important because at least for me, it's helped me, even if I, you know, spend an hour on the phone with someone and only use like one quote that they've said uh, in the story, it still helps me get a better understanding of everything else that's happening. Um, so in that sense, like it's, it's really rewarding, even if you only have like a little bit of a piece of an interview that, that gets used, um, having that better understanding just, you know, it can help you in the future, but also it's just, I don't know, I enjoy learning things about how complicated this, this whole process is. Um, uh, and I apologize for any audio in the background. My neighbors have chose this moment to cut down all of their trees, apparently. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I'm curious. I mean, this is this is something that could be read. You know, you're all uh, recent Columbia grads. You know, um, you know, and this is something that's going to be read by 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 students. I, I, I assume. So, do you guys have any advice for reporting remotely? Because uh, I guess that that's something that could be a very real part of all of our lives. And like, I didn't know how to navigate any of this. Uh, and we were all, and you guys were sort of thrown into this like completely foreign reporting environment. Uh, so I'm curious if you have advice for, for for people on you know managing that. Start with the C. Um, sure. I mean, I think that um, as someone who has done most of his reporting, you know, <laughs> remotely at this point, um, I I would say that. Uh, it's not it's not scary necessarily. Uh, I mean, I to me, I haven't felt intimidated. Um, I think that you know a lot of what you learn about source building and about cultivating you know trying to get to the people that you want to get to is going to be the same whether it's remote or whether it's um, you know in person. Uh, you know, a lot of the conversations, especially with people who aren't you know in a place that you can go and you know have a coffee with, are going to be. Uh, are going to at least initiate remotely. And I think that nothing about that has changed. Um, and, you know, I think a, a lot of it has to do with knowing how the source that you're trying to get in touch with is likely to be reachable. You know, it's, for example, if you're, go if you're trying to talk to an academic, they generally don't appreciate it. or don't always appreciate it when you call their direct line at a university. But if you're calling uh, an elections clerk or a public official, who has a number listed, that's a really good way to get in touch with them because that's what they're there for. Um, so, um, you know, um, I, would, I would say, you know, think about, th think about who it is you're trying to reach, how it is you're likely to reach them, you know, is it going to, you know, 
are you going to you know have some more success you know DMing them on on Twitter or texting them or something like that because that is true of some sources. Um, that that doesn't change the way you get into them doesn't change and then you know how the conversation that you have um, you know in many ways it's it's you know doing it remotely is a little easier because it's it's there's a, a lot of ways you can you know set things up so that you can record a conversation and that the, and the sound quality is reasonably good for you to be able to use it later on so I wouldn't be intimidated by that um, and I wouldn't forget the basics of of how to build sources. I'd second that, and I think to a certain extent, COVID also helped in terms of reaching out to people. Because we've, every one of us has been going through this. So I feel like it was like a good icebreaker. Because there was always like, for me, it was suddenly my cat running like across the screen in the midst of an interview. But then the other person maybe had a baby crying in the background. So it was like everyone could just relate to how kind of like strange this is, but at the same time, all of us had to kind of like deal with it. So I think it, one could almost say that COVID was a bit helpful when it came to basically being confined to your phone when it comes to reporting. Um, and I think apart from that, it totally helped me to come up with some sort of structure. Like, I feel like I'd always, I'm not the biggest fan of working from home. I'm just not. So kind of to kind of come up with some sort of structure to start my day and then just to stick with it totally helped me to kind of adapt to that new setting. Anybody else? Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, it's an interesting, you know, thought there. I, I never thought about this, but I, I'm curious, did, did just talking to people on a day-to-day -day basis help you guys sort of deal with the, the sort of day-to-day -day of the pandemic? I mean, you guys actually got to talk to, to adults every day uh, in other places, you know, was that, was that helpful for you personally, just to, to just sort of keep yourself in the work and keep yourself in the moment? Definitely. Yes. <laughs> um, go ahead. No, I was just saying same same thing here. Um, it's yeah. There's some days where I you know won't leave my apartment or I don't speak with my parents or my friends and and my sources are the only people I speak with and I'm like oh it's nice to hear you know a human voice from the other end of the line. Mm -hmm. Katarina is the only one of you I have physically met, which is weird for me. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so hopefully that will change sometime soon. But um, uh, cool. I think. I mean, I, I think that's all the questions that I can think of. I don't know, Donna, how long these things are supposed to last. So usually uh, about an hour is what we aim for. So this is fantastic. I feel like I've learned so much and gotten so much background into all this great work I've seen come out, and I really appreciate you guys all doing that. I think mm -hmm. it's really important for, well, as you've said, you know when these stories can be so politicized and partisan seeming. It's really important for people to see how they're made. And you guys have made so many great points for that effect. Um, uh, and also as like a program, I don't know if people watching this or, or reading this might not know, you know, how we work, where it's handed, it's sort of handed down through the generations. So you guys have done great at adding to that archive to help future CJI fellows understand what's going on and what they can expect. So this has just been great, I think. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to do it.